what they have done to our country by allowing these millions and millions of people to come into our country. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. It's Friday the 13th, Nelson. Oh, yeah. You know what that means. We're back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. You may not be listening until Saturday the 14th. You shouldn't listen. We're bad luck. But we're recording on Friday 13th. Nelson, bad luck. What's we up, got bud? a big show planned today, man. Yeah, absolutely. We got to recap this crazy presidential debate that you heard a little uh, snippet from. That was weird. That, that was, was weird. weird. Some might say disgusting even. Yeah, I don't eat cats. Um, but also, we might want to make a mention of this Friday the 13th superstition. You know, it hasn't been around that long. I listened to a report on WHQR NPR this morning, and they said that folk historians say that Friday the 13th is really not that old at all, maybe a couple of centuries old. Oh, really? And it, apparently, the number 13 is not superstitious the world over, right? Chinese might believe that 11's more superstitious than any other number. On, uh, if you ever go on a cruise, and I know you have, but yeah. you went on a, a, an Italian line. Italian you went on line, MSC. man. 13 so they, floor, no, no, no problem. No, no, no. They don't have 17. Yeah, they, they have 13. They don't have 17, but they do have 13. And on an American ship or a carnival, which I guess yeah. is, I don't know where yeah, they yeah. register them anymore. But yeah, you don't, you don't. everybody who's been on, all of our listeners who have been on a cruise know you don't have a 13th yeah, floor. Yeah, don't have a 13th 12 floor. 12 to 14, baby. Uh, some historians even believe that the number 13 uh, sort of comes from... Uh, a Christian um, beliefs about the Last Supper or the number of disciples or something like that. Do you believe in luck? I don't know, but that is something that we are going to definitely talk about later on. Perhaps, uh, I don't know, I was thinking next St. Patty's Day or something. Speaking of luck and cats, yeah. I have two black cats, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't think they've done anything to me. I feel well, pretty good about it. we did them. talk a little bit about luck, superstition on and our cats. Halloween episode. Remember that? We did. And that's coming up again soon. Hey, as your well. snack just walked into the room. Yeah, I just noticed. Uh, <laughs> I just noticed that <laughs> old Fiji. Yeah, he's back. Uh, in. But let's do a little debate recap after this break, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, well, okay. Did you know that Friday the Thirteenth, as a day of bad luck in the U.S., is actually a pretty new superstition? It all came here from England. Moira Marsh is a folklore librarian at Indiana University Bloomington. The first recorded instance we have of that in print is 1913. Many people will tell you that it's very, very ancient. It is not. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. If you're just joining us, I am Jason McCoy, alongside my good friend and co-host Nelson Boyer. We're the cast of Put Put Him on on the the Couch. couch. Today we're talking about the presidential debate. Going to look a little bit at the emotion known as disgust as we talk a little bit about the biology of politics. We the biology thought- of voting, the biology of political affiliation. But Nelson, let's recap this uh, this crazy, some might say weird or even disgusting Yeah, look, debate. I mean, I thought uh, President Harris, or I'm sorry, Vice President Harris did, uh, did well. I think most pundits would agree. I think most Republicans would agree. He got a shot of the Insta polls and everything, and they said she did well. And, you know, I think it was like 67% who watched uh, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents thought so, she won so the you, debate. So you don't agree he won hands down, and that's the reason why he's not going to do it again, because well, like a prize fighter, he said on his Truth <laughs> look, Social, he's not going to give her another you, shot, you know, right? Political scientists, and I'll throw myself in there as well, we, we, you've always been confused by presidential debates uh, in terms of how much they matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because a lot of us watch to support. Um, I'm sure you did. Mm-hmm. I did. I mean, well, we, honestly, I watched to see what kind of crazy something's going to come out of uh, former yeah, President Trump's some, mouth. Some people and are then curious. Also I, want, I was curious as to watchers. how she might respond, right? If they gave us that split screen, was she going to like t- be taken aback by it? Was she going to roll her eyes? Was she going to, you know, wrinkle up her nose and show one of those disgust responses that I know too often affected the viewers at home, right? Well, if you're me- like me, you definitely were disgusted when he went into the. Um, Eating cats and dogs. I was more confused. But I'll tell you this. You know, all the data suggests that the most a debate can move the needle is 1%. I saw all these people, these, um, you know, unaffiliated voters. Reuters did one. The the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, Mm -hmm. they all 
had a group of voters that they had after the debate, they talked to them. And I, I almost kind of laugh because so many of them are like, well, they didn't answer the questions. Yeah, yeah. And what we know for sure, based on all of our research in political science, mm-hmm. is that the individual, and or, I'm sorry, the questions mm-hmm. and the answers to policy questions sure. really don't influence how people yeah, vote. I could, I could buy that. I mean, I think social psychologists, something I'm talking about this week in all of my introductory psychology classes, would argue, look, to the extent that we are all social creatures, we've been uh, sort of born and raised over millennia in groups, both small and large, eventually, right? And some social psychologists, including Jonathan Haidt at New York University, um, would argue that there are several dimensions to our social life. One of them is this idea that uh, things are either far away from us or close, which includes, by the way, our friends, family, neighbors, those kinds of people, even the others, right, even the strangers, the ones that are not like us. They're either far away from us and we'll never come into contact with them, or they're pretty close to us, so we need to be thinking about them and watching out for them. The other dimension is uh, arguably just as important, maybe even more important, and it's something we talked about last uh, week in our episode on power, and this has to do with things that are, and people that are above us and or below us. So this would include hierarchies for power and status, right? Mm -hmm. And a third dimension that might be relatively new throughout evolutionary history is this idea of a divinity dimension. Now, I know... There are plenty of us out there, including some of our listeners, who don't believe in God, who don't believe in religion, or maybe don't consider themselves spiritual at all, myself included, newsflash. But you have to admit, throughout evolutionary history, there's been many, many, many opportunities for rules. There have been times where, especially in larger groups and tribes, we have become exposed to new pathogens that we can spread between one another. The way we Um, eat animals the way we cook animals. Remember, we didn't always do that. We used to just eat from their carcasses. Because we couldn't. Yeah, so it would make sense that we needed rules, right? And so to the extent that we believe that things are pure or that we believe that things can be tainted and we believe that things can be spread, I mean, think about this. It seems as if disease transmission goes one way, even before we had a good understanding of the germ theory of disease, right? You can imagine our ancestors sort of just automatically being born with this intuit intuition about you can taint something that is pure with something impure. Right. But it doesn't go the other way, right? So if I'm pure and I touch something dirty, I don't make that dirty thing pure. Right. Um, It's sort of one-way road. So so to this extent, in order to keep yourself but also the tribe safe, you'd probably start passing on religion, perhaps at least traditions, rituals. Certainly rules, rules about what you could eat. And, and these what you things, eat. you know, they might one day become the moral order or eventually they might one day become religious doctrine, right? And so some of these social psychologists along with neuroscientists believe that disgust might have actually began first as an emotion to kind of guard your mouth from impurities, poisons, kind of like that that first line of defense uh, to help your immune system. And then eventually, since you have other ways for pathogens to get into your body, right? Other orifices, um, disgust begins to sort of move towards other aspects of the body more generally, including but not limited to sexual openings. And so from there, it's not hard to start thinking, wow, as humans begin to evolve and they started making more associations, you can start to think about moral violations um, in all sorts of ways, symbolically, and then you can think about it through um, our safe handling practices or, or whatever practices we use when we hunt, when we eat. I mean, you go the world over and people have all of these strange sort of hiccups about how you cook food, how you kill animals, how you preserve them, um, how you eat them. Do you use the right hand, left hand, both? Now, again, I would argue a lot of this is probably superstitious. However, to the extent that some of this behavior got codified, and it helped keep our ancestors alive, it makes sense that there'd be many people among us, we might call them conservatives, that are like, you know what? I have this pension. I have this predisposition for wanting to do things a certain way, a routine, a ritual. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. I can tell you that in political science, the research is very clear. We vote based on the people that we like, Mm-hmm. And we reject anything that does not conform but to again, the policy. Yes, we don't I, vote on policy. I we think vote those dovetail, though. You said it. Uh, we vote about we vote against yes, people we don't but, like. But, but why, when you why, say, why don't we like them? Okay, but when you say mm-hmm. um, about conservatives that they want to do things a certain way 
it's almost it, it's it smacks of a vague moral superiority. No, as if you're saying one way is right. I mean, look, just give me. But uh, most of us do believe one way is right. Uh, okay, well, open the, and closed. What one has a positive connotation? What one has a negative connotation? Well, no, I would I would prefer to think you know rotten or pure. I would I would prefer to think. Yes, but what you just said was that harm. But you you made it seem as if conservatives are less likely to be open to new experiences. They are one hundred percent in study after study the world over. But don't you think that's a negative? Don't you think that it's like a? I don't know. I don't know if it's a slam, but doesn't that seem negative? No, it depends on the kind of situation you find yourself in or the context. Look, if there really are people out there who are trying to um, infiltrate, trait my group. If there really are people out there who would do me harm, if there really are people out there that could spread disease and spread bad intentions, then to the extent that I'm closed off or, quote, socially conservative, might actually benefit my tribe or my group. I'm not saying it's one way or the other. I'm just saying if you just think about all of the different things that religions all over the world seem to be concerned about, care versus harm, fairness versus cheating. I mean, you, you'd be hard-pressed not to find a spiritual group on this earth from yesteryear or today that doesn't care about these things, loyalty versus betrayal, authority versus subversion. And, and you're sanct- saying and our new religion, de- our civic religion is politics? Uh, no, but I'm saying that's one place in which all of this stuff can kind of play itself out. It's it, not just politics. It has to do with whether or not uh, you um, are comfortable around people that are not like you. So our, our, our views on immigration policy, what I would argue is liberals do have a morality. They just care about certain arms of that morality, certain tenets. If, if, if we agree that there are tenets to morality. Well, like, go back to care versus Yeah, harm. care versus harm. So, I think both liberals and conservatives alike care a whole lot about taking care of versus harming, right? And so um, liberals may be pro-choice because they are concerned about how much care we give the mother and how much harm we might be doing to the mother if we don't let her make her own decisions. Conservatives, okay. conservatives, exactly the same, but the opposite. They too care about care, but they care more about the care and the safety of the baby and the life of the baby or the unborn. Okay, but that's an obvious example. Right. Ex- extrapolate that. Care versus harm. Where else does it go? Um, I, I think it goes with your own, right? Caring for your own. Caring for people. So that immigration. Are, immigration. I can see it with that. Uh, I can see it with just caring for people in your own state, states' rights. I can okay, see it but with- how does that square with religion? Because there is no your own. I would in disagree religion. hardcore, right? Wait, we- what in the Christian faith says? Uh, you- how many Love, religions care, are there? You're just talking your about own. the one you're most familiar okay, with. Okay, well, that's the one most of our listeners are familiar with. It doesn't we matter. Are, there's uh, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of religions, and so we think care and harm. Um, I think all of them do have a sense of care and harm. Um, but I would argue that some of them probably care for their own more than they do somebody else. Uh, we've gone to war over religious ideology never. since the inception of never. religion. No, never. never been any crusades. No, never. That. No. Yeah. Okay, the one, crusades Nelson, are the one example. No, no, no. The crusades <laughs> are the one. That's enough. I don't we, want to get into the weeds <laughs> here on this, but fairness versus cheating. I'd also agree. Wouldn't you also agree that whether you're a liberal, a libertarian, or a conservative, you care about Fairness, Absolutely. equality versus cheating. Everybody cheating. wants fairness. Everybody does. So, and I think these, both of these things, by the way, are ways to bring liberals and Democrats alike together. Okay. Right? If we're talking about morality and we focus on care versus harm, fairness versus cheating, I think we're all on the same page. Now, loyalty versus betrayal. There's where I think we start to move away a little bit, right? I don't know that liberals care as much about loyalty as maybe conservatives do. Oh, I disagree. When you, well, particularly when you think about... Uh, a, a Donald Trump versus a Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden's not out there saying, oh, my God, I can't believe you guys undermine me. You pushed me out of the presidential race, whining and crying. Can you imagine if anybody of any significance came out and said Trump needs to drop out because he's too old, he's too weird, he's too disgusting? No, he would lament at, at worst, or excuse me, at best, and at worst, he'd be talking about, you know, hanging those Republicans. In fact, he's already upset with some of the Republicans like Matt, uh, like Kinzinger and others. A third one, authority versus, versus subversion, right? Yes, I mean, liberals can get into authority, and they can uh, take very seriously somebody who subverts their authority, but you have to admit, the world over, the more conservative, particularly the strong men, particularly the, um, 
the monarchs, the super conservatives, the, the, the dictators, they are really into their authority and they hate it and they'll try to stamp out any sniff of subversion. And then finally, there's sanctity and degradation. And this one, I think, has the um, most potential to help us understand, maybe get our arms around this idea of why in poll after poll and in study after study, the more uh, conservatives politically are also simultaneously the most homophobic, the most xenophobic. Ooh, um, man. And we also I'm find that they're... back on this. You can. But, I mean, that, that just are, those are the facts. Any way you ask them, whether it's asking a survey to find out how, how conservative they are, or you look at their voting behavior, or you <clears throat> induce induce their um, disgust. You can take a person into a lab, induce them through images to feel disgusting, and then you can ask them questions, moral judgment questions, and it will make them more conservative. So we can even take a liberal, disgust them with images, with smells, with taste. Uh, some of my own research has done this with gross-tasting jelly beans, and literally nudge them, push them on the sort of moral compass towards the conservative end. Again, okay. sanctity degradation, but, you can appreciate this. Disgust, like all but, emotions, help preserve our species. None unlike fear. Fear made sure that we didn't make really silly mistakes and kill ourselves too quickly. That, that's Disgust, fine. Disgust, same way. I, I understand now that from I think, an evolutionary standpoint, yeah. but I want to go back to just one example. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to loyalty. Mm, okay. Versus, what and was betrayal. There? And betrayal. Okay, fine. So... You're saying the conservatives come down on a loyalty side. Yeah. Okay. A, a bit more. Okay. They care more about loyalty than, um, on average, than liberals. Okay. And, and what what I would say, and this might seem In other words, like semantics to you. Conservatives see it more as a moral violation. Th this might seem like semantics to you, mm -hmm. which is fine, but it's not. It's a really important point. Mm -hmm. I think we have to define what we mean when we say conservative, because I feel like you're using Donald Trump and the modern day Republican Party mm -hmm. as a standard for conservatism. No, most of these what was the only president done. to lose his office, to resign from office? Nixon. OK, Nixon resigned with a Republican House and a Republican sure. Senate. He did not have the support of his Republican colleagues mm -hmm. in the House and the Senate. Right. Yeah. That's why he left. That's why he left office. He might have. He, now, in today's environment, he might have stayed. No, we, we just but, ask people, Nelson. We just ask how them, is that? where are you on the scale from staunchly conservative, libertarian, all right, the way but to that staunchly doesn't, liberal? That plays out in a lab setting, but no, no, no. We history ask people, seems to show us something different. We ask people where they are, and then we give them things like the discuss sensitivity scale, and or we give them questionnaires that ask them um, questions about what they feel regarding homosexuality, trans rights, gay marriage. And what I'm telling you is self-proclaimed conservatives not only say that they are morally outraged or disgusted by gay marriage and gay sex and the like, but they also vote for candidates who will echo those kinds of things. You can't deny that. No, now, I, know, now, I know they do that. Yeah, now, but... speaking of... Speaking of um, Disgust sensitivity. I know you've got to be wondering, like, what are some of these questions on these scientific disgust sensitivity scales? How do they assess the extent to which you are easily disgusted versus somebody else not so easily disgusted? Uh, one of the um, premier scales that's been validated <clears throat> throughout the years that many social psychologists use is a disgust sensitivity scale. And it has 32 items. And basically you answer, right, by whether or not um, you would absolutely uh, feel obliged to do it all the way to it's completely and utterly forbidden under any circumstance, okay? So I'll give you a couple of them. You ready? Let's go. Uh, I might be willing to try eating monkey meat under some circumstances. Yes. All right. Um, it would not upset me to watch a person with a glass eye take that eye out of the socket. No, it would not it upset would not. me. Uh, I never let any part of my body touch the toilet seat in a public washroom. Um, no, no I, that's not me. Uh, you see maggots on a piece of meat in an outdoor garbage pail. Um, does it disgust you? Yeah. Yeah. Even though you're not going to eat it or touch it. it yeah, that's you. gross. It disgusts you. I hate maggots. Um, you take a sip of a soda and then you realize you drank from the glass that an acquaintance of yours had been drinking from. Doesn't bother me. Uh, you see a man with his intestines exposed after an accident. Um, probably. I mean, like, I don't, I don't know. I can't. I, I, uh, you hear about an adult 
Well, I, would, few, I guess I would say no. You hear about an no. adult woman who has sex with her father. Yes. Uh, you it's hear disgusting. about a 30-year-old man who seeks sexual relations with an 80-year-old woman. Yes. Yeah. So my point is, and as part of the sexual education class, you're required to inflate a new lubricated condom using your mouth. Yeah. Okay. So again, that's uh, just the people that, that in, be a taste. I think. Uh, people take these 32 statements and they basically answer um, in a way that indicates just how right disgusted they are by each of these statements, and you get a score that ranges from some number to some higher number. And on average, people who vote conservatively, who agree with the statement, I am politically conservative, on average, people that say, I think gay uh, marriage is wrong, or I don't believe that a homosexual should have the same rights, or I think gay sex is dirty, do indeed um, find themselves more easily disgusted by more of these items. Okay. Yeah. Well, what, what I, my problem with focusing on a, a physical, visceral reaction to certain circumstance in order to try to figure out how people vote mm-hmm. is we're ignoring all the other factors that we know influence voting. I'm talking now about family. I'm talking, of course, about tribalism. Yeah. Right? Well, no, I was I just mean, talking about disgust because Donald Trump brought it up when he suggested <laughs> that there are people in Springfield, Missouri. I just think that was disgusting. Killing, eating people's pets. Like, he was insinuating that we really do need to close this border because all these dirty people are infiltrating our country. It's a racist And they're doing trope. these outrageous things, right? But he's playing into, let's not mistake this, he's playing into not care harm so much, not fairness cheating, not loyalty betrayal, not even authority or subversion, although maybe, but he's definitely playing into this sanctity versus degradation card, right? Yes. He's saying that's not... Cool. That's dirty. That's disgusting. Who have we that's become? Degrading. How are we letting We're these animals. people in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you know who but else? But that's an old used? racist trope. Yeah, it's been and, there forever. And you, yeah, well, that's. Uh, I'm just simply saying, yes, it's been there forever because it's been part of our moral sort of code in some way, shape, form, or fashion throughout perhaps all of evolutionary history. Now, I'm always fascinated by why liberals in general don't seem to be as hung up about all five of these arms of morality as conservatives. And more, more specifically, how it is that liberals, even though they say, yes, I care about car- care and harm, or I care about loyalty and betrayal, don't associate that stuff with eating certain animals necessarily, or who you have sex with, or what color your skin is, or who you pray towards. It seems like... Um, conservatives are just much tighter about it. They're much more Hence um, the name. scrupulous about it, right? <laughs> like the name. They pucker up. They get really, really tight. Yeah, but I, really again, I want to be careful. It. I don't really think there... It, it, again, it seems like when we use this language, and maybe this is just me projecting as, as a as person a who's more liberal. Um, I'm a, what, do, what, what does that look? I'm a liberal guy. Yeah. Look at my voting record. Uh, well, voting record is not the only one. You said that in the beginning. Like, how are we measuring it? I don't know. Maybe you've just convinced yourself that you're liberal and really you're more conservative than you ever thought. No. Especially when you compare yourself to others that score really low on this disgusting You're not You're not like disgusted myself. by maggots? 100% not. I see them oh, almost man, every time crazy. I open my trash can. All right. You do use In fact, I've pee. eaten them in a biology lab in graduate school. Well, great. Yeah. But you're... <laughs> I was going to say, would you eat? Would you got the South Hey, Carolina. careful, careful know, with the South Carolina. I know, I know. Mealworms? I mean, I would you eat mealworms? Would you eat crickets again? Uh, yeah, I'd eat a cricket. Yeah, I'd but again, cricket. ask yourself, who's more concerned about, you know, what the color of, color of skin people are? Who's more concerned about the spices they use? Who's more concerned about, concerned about the music they listen to? I mean, it seems like over and over and over, it is. The more conservative you are, the more you want to keep things the same and keep people out who are ruffling your feathers I are, think that's true. You know I, I mean? I, I think and again, by and large, what I guess I'm true. saying is it's maybe not their fault. There's something in our biology, something in our DNA, something in our long evolutionary life history that's made it so that disgust is part of our immune system. And, and over the years, over millennia, it's gotten to the point where, wow, scrunching up your nose and tightening yourself up and avoiding contact with certain types of people, particularly if they're engaged in certain behavior, really may... Be really may, maybe that is, um, at least evolutionarily speaking, a technique to sort of give your immune system a little insurance, right? Like if I stay That's away fine. from the thing That's that can fine. hurt me. But it, it ignores political science reality in that we can figure out, demographically speaking, who's going to vote for whom. Yeah, we can. So wait a minute. Why would there be a gender gap if what you're saying is 
is true. Why would there be? Uh, an, well, why would there be an education gap? Why would the? Well, there isn't why, an education or much of a gender gap when it comes to disgust sensitivity. Now, I do agree that there's a gender gap when it comes to. What about the racial gap? Yeah, I mean, how can there, we explain that with disgust only? Oh well, I would never say you can dis- explain any of this with disgust only. I was simply talking about the uh, the role that an emotion like disgust might help play in in um, bringing us closer to understanding the the electorate. Um, not to suggest that it's the only thing. I mean, I could take another one or two emotions to sort of help create a more full picture. Obviously, fear. You know yourself, people vote based upon um, being afraid, right? So if if there's um, fear works, yeah. If there's a In both there's directions. an enemy at the gate, Donald yeah, Trump's probably yeah. going to get a few extra votes, right? Um, and and vice versa. Not if he's the enemy. Well, we would right. never. His voters I'm, definitely aren't going to say that. Um, but you see that now, even yeah. if you you know the polls, right? Like yeah. overall, maybe Kamala Harris has got him just by right right there within the margin of error. But then when you start looking at well, who you think do the best job um, on war in the Middle East? They say Trump. Who would do the most job, best job on immigration, right? Keeping those immigrants out, Trump. Like, if we need a strong man, he's the guy to do it. Um, there's all sorts of gender bias. There's all sorts of um, gender phobias circulating out there. Always have, probably always will. I imagine that no matter how strong and how good Kamala Harris is, I mean, the gender bias is going to be such that we believe that women can't do that job. Women can't keep us uh, safe. Women can't keep the border closed. He's winning on that. Yeah, well, at least among men. Yes, but to be fair, regardless of who's been running, conservatives have been winning on that. I mean, I don't think you'd see a difference if Nikki Haley were at the top of the Republican ticket, for instance. Yeah, probably not. So I don't know that it again, has. Conservatives are believed to be the ones in authority. They're in charge. They're strong. They're powerful. And uh, liberals are all about, you know, they're they're wishy washy. They have yeah, what a double and triple standards. Type. They're they're. They're, you know, our, our beliefs are sanitized. We are subvert. We are subversive. They view su- progressivism with subversivism. So I want to talk f- about tolerance is weakness. I, <laughs> yeah, that's. I want to talk about some other things that we know influence voter behavior. Yeah, how they relate to psychology and evolutionary psychology. Okay, let's do that right after this break. It's not that one side wants to harm the other side, but just that they are trying to protect someone different. America is many things to many people. Our research suggests that liberals divide the world into those that are very vulnerable to harm, like marginalized communities, and those that are very invulnerable to harm, like business leaders. On the other hand, conservatives are more likely to see everyone as about equally vulnerable to harm. Take immigration, for example. Our research shows that liberals see undocumented immigrants as very vulnerable to harm. You've got mothers, children fleeing persecution. And so from the liberals' perspective, undocumented immigrants are victims. They need protecting. On the other hand, conservatives will see undocumented immigrants more as a threat. They're taking jobs. They are members of drug cartels who have harmed Americans. And so in their mind, undocumented immigrants are not victims as much as potential perpetrators. And so for both sides, they're trying to protect people from harm. They just see different. Thanks for joining us, Couch Surfers. We are Put Them on the Couch. I'm your host, Jason McCoy, alongside my good friend and colleague, Nelson Boyer. We're talking politics. We're talking cats and dogs and disgust (laughs) and voting behavior. Uh, I was just talking with Nelson on the other side about the role that maybe this emotion of disgust has and continues to play um, in the decisions we make, particularly moral judgments that we make, which can in many ways help inform uh, who we sort of go with, who we ride with when we're when we're making that vote in these elections. And speaking of the upcoming election, Nelson, you wanted to talk a little bit more about Maybe some other psychological some other, and or biological yeah, 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 evolutionary go. mechanisms. All right. So uh, like what? What we know for sure is mm-hmm. that if you go with one party mm-hmm. for three consecutive elections, okay. your chances of remaining with that party for the rest of your life are overwhelming. Really? Well over 80%. Yeah. So I want to focus a little bit on negative partisanship and tribalism. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious from a psychological standpoint. And we've talked about sports and teams yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Is the same thing at play here? I think are, it, I are, think are that's some right. people yeah. married to 
Donald Trump, his behavior. Because they see them because, as one of them. Because, not because they see it, but because they just don't want the other team to win. Well, they see they, they are aligned with him more than they are the other team, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. And it may not be that I feel like he represents my values, but maybe he represents the people that I like, I care for, that I see myself a part of even, right? Like I can see myself saying, well, I don't necessarily like this candidate, but I like my wife and I like my friends and uh, I think... I'm closer to them than I am these other people over here who are going to vote for this other candidate. So that's my group. That's my tribe. I'm going with them. I mean, I do think that happens sometimes. I'm, look, I'm a slave to the truth, but mm-hmm. I'm just curious from your perspective, how difficult is it to do something like Liz Cheney, uh, Adam Kinzinger, Mitt Romney, Dick Cheney? Ask Stanley how Milgram. How hard is Ask it Philip to... Zimbardo. Ask any of these who are these people? historical greats in social psychology who... Put to the test. Do you give them credit? The, Is that impressive? Oh, my God. It's very impressive. Look, Stanley Milgram in the 60s wanted to know experimentally if he could make, with little effort, average people off the streets of New Haven, Connecticut. He was a professor of psychology at um, Is this the Yale University. Yale, no, 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 but he, he, this guy was taught by the guy who did the line experiment, the conformity experiment by Solomon Ash. But no, Stanley Milgram, he brought some men into a laboratory, paid them $4 for their, for their um, lunch hour, and basically um, asked them if they would shock someone if they missed a question that they were asking them. Okay. And uh, he put this really intimidating-looking machine in front of them that had all of these little dials that went from, like, 15 volts all the way up to, like, 450 volts. And basically, I'm getting, like, Princess, yeah. princess well, no, Bride and, vibes. And basically you know what, what was about? supposed Take to happen is off your life. you ask a question, the other person gets it wrong, and, of course, what you didn't know if you were in the study was the other person was a Confederate. They were in on it. They weren't really being oh, shocked, okay. but you thought they were going to be shocked. And so you shocked them. And then, you know, these participants were like, I don't really want to do this. Um, I don't want to take responsibility for this. And then Milgram, uh, the guy in the white lab coat there, would say, you must do it. Like, the, the study requires this. Uh, you don't have to be taking responsibility for it. I'll take responsibility for it. And here's the thing. 67% of all the men in that study went all the way to 450 volts. They, shot, they, they thought they were shocking the person on the other side of the room. They okay. had seen Milgram okay. you know, hook him up to electrodes and put them in a chair and strap them in. They saw the wire coming off their body through the wall and into this big intimidating machine that they were now in control of. And seven almost out of ten men did it. But these were seven normal, regular men. And why did they do it? Simply because they had an authority figure there saying, you know what, I'll take the blame. I'll take the responsibility. And that was appealing. Yeah. Or appealing enough to So what I'm saying is that was hard, hard, hard for any of them to stop. Nobody stopped until they had shocked many, many times. Right? The other 33%, they still shocked. They didn't say, no, I'm not going to hurt this other person. I see. They still did it. But they, so you asked me what kind of person would go, no, I ain't doing that. Somebody who's seen enough and their conscience Man, I don't know time. any. I don't know any. So when you do find one like a Liz Cheney, a John McCain, or someone else who steps up and says, I'm going against my tribe, that is just fantastical. Like, it's hard to even believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what about the other side? Tulsi Gabbard, um, RFK Jr. What about, I mean, don't, don't we have to give it the same level of respect? Even though our own political bias, biases tell us, no, that's not correct? I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard is one thing. I mean, I think she's an opportunist. But uh, RFK, he just seems like, seriously, the worms have been eating too much of his brain. <laughs> we I, talked about I, I, It's hard for me to even take him seriously. But Tulsi I Gabbard, you, I, I think, is a pretty smart lady. She's shrewd politically, although how shrewd, I don't know, given the fact she hasn't won anything since It's funny how it, It's funny our own biases do creep mm-hmm. in, don't they? Oh, of course. I mean... They're, they did the same thing. So mm-hmm. how can we label one X and one Y just based off of yeah. our own beliefs? But I mean, going back again to these five arms. Uh, to be arms clear, of, I do too. Uh, these I, five arms of morality, right? Yeah, that yeah. The world seems all religions care about care, harm, fairness, cheating, loyalty, betrayal, authority, subversion, sanctity, degradation. I mean, I would make the case that these are all really important sort of substrates of morality. These are all important criteria for morality from a, you know, an evolutionary view from long, 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 long time ago, all the way up to modern day, right? Like I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine making many, if any serious decisions on this earth without associating with one or more of these, right? Can you think of any serious decision you've made in your life that doesn't have something to do with, you know, care versus harm, fairness versus cheating, loyalty versus betrayal, authority versus subversion or sanctity versus degradation? I mean, it's almost as if, yeah, we can't help it, but these hmm. are pretty fundamental yeah. to everything we do, everything we, 
Uh, every person we meet, every idea we have, every decision we have to make, right? From something as simple as what we're going to have for dinner tonight, yep. <laughs> how it's going to be cooked, <laughs> how right. we're going to eat it with our hands, with a knife, with a fork, and then how we're going to clean up afterwards. Right. You know, are we going to just wipe it down with water? Are we going to wipe it down with our hands? Are we going to use some kind of antimicrobial? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's I, uh, I, I, that's why I bring in tribalism mm-hmm. and negative partisanship because if you go to something like um, authoritarian versus uh, authority, uh, sorry, authority versus version, yeah. or if you go to something like care versus harm, mm-hmm. um, you know, morally speaking, I know so many people that I'm friends with that are family members who think that President Trump morally doesn't represent them, mm-hmm. that his behavior isn't of them or of yeah, yeah. becoming of the office. And yet they still rationalize. Well, there's four the other, other there's tribe four other arms, is right? Even, there's the, fairness uh, and cheating. Do we think he's fair? Yeah. I mean, a lot oftentimes we think the other side cheat right, to keep exactly, him out, right? Yeah, and then loyalty yeah. betrayal. Man, how many people have betrayed Trump? Right? Like a lot of them have betrayed Trump and all those people like they took off and is wrote these betrayal? bad books. Well, is, that's is what that really Trump would betrayal? argue. See, I don't know if it really is, but that's certainly the What if you're just a like I said, what if you're a slave the line. of the truth? Hey, that's certainly the line being told, right? Trump says that these people you know, they betrayed him. They they undermined him. He fired him, and then they went out and they talked bad about him and wrote a book about him, right? I guess. Um, and then I, you get into authority and subversion. They definitely subverted him. At least he's going to tell you they did. And then, yeah, sanctity, degradation. Look, we are degrading our country if we let more and more of, quote, them in. We are degrading our communities well, that's if we let them li- loot and litter yeah. and kill our animals and eat yeah. them. And it's just well, that disgusting. goes back to the whole line, right? Make America oh, great yeah. again. It's just like and so. I guess what he's really saying is let's let's keep it pure and let's let's come on. America first is care for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, fairness is I want to make sure that we um, have fairness in voting. No cheating. Um, you got to be loyal to me. The, the racial that's, undertones are are clear. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I would argue, um, or not argue, I would point out that we are certainly not the only civilization with these concerns. No. If you go to, if you go to China, they are overwhelmingly Han. That's their ethnicity. Mm-hmm. And they are brutal to toward anybody non-Han that Han look Chinese. Like yes. Oh mm-hmm. my goodness. Yeah. The Uyghurs, of course, yeah, most of our listeners over, know, you? uh, you see that in Europe, all right? You mm-hmm. certainly see that with the Nazis. You see that with the Italians in the 1930s. Yeah. You saw I mean, that, yeah, you definitely saw it, that with the Jews, right? They were vermin, in fact, they're dirty. You could, you could argue that the United States isn't not only is not unique, but isn't even Close extreme to the way those compared work, yeah. to some of these other civilizations. Yeah, I haven't heard Trump talk about the way migrants smell. I mean, I, I remember um, reading some things about uh, the Jews during World War II, and they said you can smell this, the weird sweetness coming off of them, right? Who yeah, said I, that? Uh, there were several writers. Weird that were pushing, sweetness? Yeah, that was pushing propaganda, right? Again, this idea that they have to be dirty. They are not pure. They're not like us. I mean, they smell a certain way. They I guess even when they smell good, way. they smell weird good. There you go. Yeah, yeah you can't cover kinda, that up, right? They're dirty. Yeah. And you hear Trump. They're bringing in disease. They're, they're bringing so in what, let's crazy. Talk about, they're bringing in rapists and what, drugs. Let's talk about other influences on electoral decision making. Yeah. Uh, well, I like this idea about, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if you mentioned it on or off the air or both, about, you know, if you are born into a particular family. Right. And family they is have the a voting biggest history, predictor. Right? They family have a voting is history the bi- biggest predictor. Of are those genes or because you also get a lot of people and maybe you would just say <laughs> those are aggressive genes, <laughs> but you get a lot of people who go against their parents. Let me ask you a question. You and your brothers, you and your parents. Yeah. Do you all share a similar political ideology? Uh, brothers shared a similar political ideology, I would imagine. Um, I'm not sure if shared the same thing with my first degree relatives, like my grandpa. What my about mom father. and dad? Uh, they didn't really. They weren't really politically active. I don't remember them voting that much, and they really didn't talk a whole lot about these kinds of issues. My granddad seemed a bit more conservative, but yeah, um, I think part of that is you can go in the voting booth still. And you can vote anonymously, right? So I don't have to go out and tell For my now. grandpa, hey, <laughs> let me tell you what I did. Even No, though but I'm talking me. about conversations around the dinner table, the old Thanksgiving table. Yeah, that's hard, too, because of what's called group think, another social psychological phenomenon. You've heard of 12 Angry Men? That um, Yeah, well, sure. This idea that we care more about harmony than we do truth. And so if you get a bunch of people in the room well, together. Well, it goes back to that uh, yes, line. I, I got the, the crazy uncle that's all racist and talking shit about immigrants at the dinner table. Yeah, but here's and my I want to keep everything harmonious, so I just but let him talk and I don't argue with him. 
if it's 11 against one, why doesn't the crazy uncle shut the fuck up? Because <laughs> he's drunk. <laughs> like, is that the reason? Though? I don't like, know. But what's what's even crazier is that the rest of us will sit there and bite our tongues. Yes. Because we want to make sure that the dinner is pretty harmonious. And yes. we don't want to ruin it for grandma, right? Who obviously doesn't have many more years to live. And we Ouch. just want, well, we just want her. <laughs> Getting dark. Well, we want everybody to enjoy that, that meal. That time. And want everybody to have a slice of that pie, right? And she loves that crazy uncle maybe just as much if not more than she loves you. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's why is it a, why, why aren't there any crazy aunts? I know, <laughs> Don't you think that's kind of sexist? It's crazy you never uncles. hear like crazy grandma. No. I mean, Obama mentioned his kind of crazy grandma. Did he really? I don't yeah. Know oh, yeah, because he said because uh, she was white. Well, Moana. Moana had a crazy grandma, right? She Who? was Moana. She wanted to I've be. I've never seen Moana. My oh, kids, were, my my kids were a little bit too old for Moana. We they got were Moana like too coming out in about a month, ladies and gentlemen. I know. I'm sure it's good. I'm sure it's good. One of the best Disney movies I've ever seen, right? Really? Yeah. And she turns into a ray. And she's swimming at night to help guide Moana on this voyage to uh, to Fiti. Anyway, you got to watch this thing, man. Well, look, Wonderful. one of the things that's kind but of but she was a weird little woman. She would dance. Was she? Yeah, she danced semi nude out in the uh, ocean's edge. She was crazy. She let her hair down. It's not crazy. And she encouraged that's Moana to to um, go against her dad's rules and defy her dad and go out there into the ocean and you know sojourn. I like that. Yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. Question authority. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm a little uncomfortable uh, with this idea of almost our electoral decisions being predetermined. It, it makes, I think, a lot of people, including myself, uneasy well, about yeah, we, the we idea like that the we idea just don't will. care about policy. And, and I'm going to give you my and that's favorite sad, example. that's sad, isn't it? Because we want to believe that to be persuasive, you got to have a, you got to bring policies. a good argument. Yeah. You got to, you got to bring a good story, they, they and it's got to be filled matter, with facts, man. right? And and to the extent that you find somebody that knows the argument, that can communicate it clearly with you, you can be swayed. Right. And what does it say about us? But what does it say about free will? Really. Well, if we, I can't want to give you my favorite. I'll give you my favorite example. Yeah, and, please. And you know, I know people would push back and say, "Well, look, you know." circumstances and facts have mm. changed opinions. Okay, fine. In 2016, the Republican Party platform was pro-free trade. Yeah. Both parties were free trade parties yeah. because, and this is true, generally speaking, mm. free trade stops wars. Yeah. If countries that trade don't usually kill. Yeah, you wouldn't. Not each you, other, they, right? They, yeah, no, That's the whole have, purpose. That's it, the it, whole it, idea <laughs> behind Robert Schuman and the yeah, yeah. European Coal and Steel Commission yeah, yeah. and the EU and all that. And But yet, that's not the case now, and right? And yet... You have a person comes along who wins the Republican nomination, yeah. rails against free trade. They're ripping us off. They're ripping yeah, us off. We're going to raise the off, tariff so high off. that nobody can get any of their goods into the country. And the Republican Party stance, and most of the people who vote Republican today are of that mindset. It's the same thing with NATO. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ronald Reagan was Mr. NATO, right? I mean, yeah. it, Republicans and Democrats, but Republicans especially, anti-Russia. This was... This was the Republican plank. This was what it was to be a Republican, strong on defense. Yeah. And now it's but one go, guy but comes go in, back to pull the back, terminology pull back, Trump pull back. Used. He used it effectively, didn't he? Those five, those five arms of the uh, the moral compass. They're cheating us. Yeah, We're not going to let them right. cheat anymore, right? We are not going to let them make idiots out of us, subvert us, right? Uh, we're going to care for our our own. They don't care. Okay, about let me us. ask you. Let me they ask you. They want to do way. us harm. Let me get it this way. Why would there be any disagreement? Or I'm sorry, why would there be any agreement? Because mm -hmm. Republicans and Democrats supported NATO. Why would there be any agreement on these issues? Was it just that politics in the 70s, 80s, and 90s really did stop at the water's edge? And the vast majority of Americans never yeah, I don't know what, had enough information about foreign policy to disagree? I don't know, I don't know how we got so far apart. I don't know how we got so polarized. But how did we ever come... Why were we ever not polarized? If I what you're saying we is We were true, moving towards this polarization, I guess, all along, you could Well, argue. we had a civil we, war. I mean, we we've been polarized and yeah. not polarized. We've Look... Look at, go back and look at elections. We've always been somewhat polarized. And I'm seeing, like, the, the biggest election you've ever seen is 60-40. Yeah. I mean, one in ten people change their minds, and it's a dead heat. I mean, right? and I maybe mean, so, this, this unprecedented opportunity, you may have it right with this social media, with the Internet, this, this ability to communicate with everybody on the earth all at once, all the time, mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, if I had a crazy idea um, 20 years ago, I would just have to sit with that crazy idea. I might go to the library and find... If I'm really lucky, some fictional accounts of someone who believes this crazy idea, right? 
but I certainly wouldn't get reinforced. I wouldn't have a huge social support structure around me. Anymore, I can just go to Reddit and find 100, 200 people that believe the exact same thing I do. And I can get inside this echo chamber and start joining these groups. And before you know it, I feel pretty mainstream, right? Okay. I'm, I'm in a group, an echo chamber, we might call it, with two, 3,000 people that believe the same shit I believe. And I'm wondering, yeah, has that done it? And then, of course, all of those subgroups could, could easily fall under one bigger camp. I mean, Trump seems very happy to take any group that will have him, doesn't he? I mean, he, he's not going to disparage any group that will vote for him. He won't call out white nationalists. He won't call out... But again, we have to be careful here. Do you believe in moral relativism? About some things, yes. Do you think that one group... I know you subscribe to one group. Is I subscribe to one better group. better or worse than the other, morally? Yes. No. Okay. No, I really don't because... Again, I well, think... If we could I remember think, that, maybe we could tone down right. the rhetoric. If I we agree. could stop calling people evil Well, again, go sick. back to those five things. I keep saying them until I'm blue in the face. Care and harm. I do think that liberals and care... And conservatives care. And conservatives care probably the same amount about the same people. Don't we care harm. about our families. We care about our dogs and cats, obviously. We care about our kids, our Dude, neighbors. come for my cats. And you're we gonna, also care gonna... about our country. Again, that's something John McCain did that I'll never forget, right? When that's the ladies right. right. stood up there at one of those um, town halls that... that John McCain had, and she said, but Obama's a Muslim. He doesn't love this country. And he said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I mean, he stopped it right there, dead in its tracks, and said, he's a good man. I know him. We have a difference of opinion on policy, right? However, he loves his country. He loves his kids. No, ma'am, he's not a Muslim. And certainly, certainly, he loves his country, right? I just, that wouldn't even happen today, I don't think. I don't know if Kamala Harris would stop somebody from saying Trump doesn't love this country. And I know Trump wouldn't stop somebody from saying Kamala Harris doesn't love this country. Again, yeah, we would do ourselves a great service and one another a great service if we remember that all of us care about uh, one another. All of us do have a, an appreciation for what's fair and what's not. We all do have a sense of loyalty and pride for our country. Well, we all do respect authority. I respect my parents. Your kids respect you. We respect our professors in college. We respect our bosses. And then sanctity degradation, of course. I mean, I'm not going to go and pee on someone's grave. I'm certainly not going to go to a cemetery and stand there and do a photo op for a political commercial. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> and to. You're still, you're, you're still all a little dig, Trump slam. A little dig a little there. A little dig. But, you know, like, of course I don't want to degrade. I mean, I, I appreciate the sanctity of life. and But, again, we just can't agree upon what that means, what that actually Where looks that like. Where that goes, exactly. Yeah. What's that yeah. look like when it comes to a clump of cells that are undifferentiated at three weeks gestation? I might argue that All right, let's do those it. are let's, not a baby, and let's do somebody a else might argue that's a baby. Let's take a quick break and do a thought experiment on the other side. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to answer using your five arms All right, as a conservative. Okay. When we think of the other side, we think that they are predators, but they're not. They're wired just the same as us. They're wired to protect themselves. It's easy to think that liberals and conservatives have a different moral mind. After all, we make different moral judgments. No matter who you are in the world, we all have a moral sense that's focused on protecting ourselves and our family and our society. But the reason we have disagreements when it comes to morality and politics today is because people disagree about who or what is most vulnerable to harm. Thanks again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jason McCoy alongside my host and good friend, Nelson Bowyer. We're the guest to put him on the couch. And we're talking... Well, we're talking about a little bit of everything today related to voting. We're talking about disgust. We're talking about political affiliation. We're talking about the extent to which being born into a family that is one political orientation might predict the rest of your voting life. Right, Nelson? That's right. On the other side, we talked about a variety of things, including eating dogs and cats. And uh, <laughs> But Nelson wants to do some kind of rapid fire with me. And he Not wants me rapid, to... But no, I you want, want me to, to pretend to, like I am a conservative. All right. And I'm the using first, these give five. Give me the first arm and I'm going to give you a policy care question. Care versus harm. Care versus harm. Yeah, I'm going to answer as a as a conservative that really thinks about the morality of care versus harming somebody. Okay. Uh -huh. You oppose, Mr. McCoy, mm -hmm. 
uh, immigration at the southern border. You yeah, propose absolutely. increasing immigration. Uh, I oppose it, yeah. I know you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you care about people. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you square yeah. that uh, policy position with... I know, care so much about people, right? Well. These immigrants included. That I don't want them to starve. I don't want them to be trafficked. I don't want them to be hoodwinked. I don't want them to be cheated out of their life's um, savings. And so I don't want to encourage or condone people coming through our southern border illegally. Okay. Um, the, these human traffickers, these, these Machiavellian smugglers are getting away with murder, literally, making all these false promises. We are only harming the people of Venezuela or the people of Haiti or the people of Mexico. And we're also harming the people that live in these border towns, on these border states, right? We're, we're basically making it so that they can't feed, they can't house their own. They can't school their own. Uh, speaking of which, just in Springfield, Missouri, you know, where they're eating dogs and cats, um, the schools are overrun. That's Public right. services are overrun. Yeah. No, um, so I actually care more true. by wanting to shut the border down until we figure out what the hell is going on. Kamala Harris, on the other hand, and the Democrats want to just subvert all that and want to just harm everyone and just keep them flooding in for political gain. All right. Well, here is President Trump mm -hmm. um, coming down the escalator in 2015 and talking in his famous little mm -hmm. diatribe about... Uh, Mexicans coming over and Mexico not sending their best? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd use the other one of fairness versus cheating, right? It's one thing, it's one thing to offer political asylum yeah. uh, to a group of people who've been oppressed or who find themselves in a situation where they and or the people they love are going to die, particularly innocent women and children. But as Trump, um, well, wait, no, no. my man pointed out, because I'm a, I'm a conservative, I believe that it's just unfair for a country to start sending people that they don't want to feed, they don't want to house, right, uh, that's they don't their... want to jail, they don't want to care for, they don't want to rehabilitate. But I wanted to ask another send question. Them to us, I so want to ask another to one for fairness. Gone, gone are those days, man. We're, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to do another one for fairness. Yeah, what's we'll the take their what, best. What's the second arm? Is that fairness? That was fairness versus cheating. I yeah. want you... Loyalty versus betrayal. I got betrayal. another question. Uh, mm -hmm. what, wait, which, 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 Whichever which is one number you two? want. Uh, number two is I, fairness and cheating. I want to do fairness and cheating with another question. Okay. There's been a lot of talk, obviously, about election security. Mm. Explain to me, please, why you think increased election monitors, uh, a deep scrub of the voter rolls, and mandatory voter ID are necessary to ensure fair elections in the United States. Well, I know people are going to say that I can't point to any hard evidence that suggests that there's systematic cheating going on. But everybody knows who has a debit card or who has a online account somewhere that every time you turn around, somebody on the news says, or every time you turn around, you get a piece of mail that says your information has been compromised. And while there's no certainty that it's been used, that it's been stolen, it's nevertheless out there for the taking. Maybe it's being used on the dark web. Maybe it's not being used today, but it'll be used tomorrow. And so if debit cards and credit cards and my social security number can be easily compromised, why can't these machines that are hooked up to these Internet accounts also be compromised the same way? So I'm not saying that there is cheating, and, and if there is, it may not be rampant right now. What I'm just saying is there's that potential since it's hooked up to the Internet. So we got to get these machines out. we got to turn them off from the Internet. we got to go back to the old school way of, like, you know, marking it with our pencil and, and, and counting it by hand. And, I, yeah, I also want to make sure, because we already know that most people – uh, that go into these um, voting precincts, they're liberal. They're not conservative. They're liberal. And they have a bias towards counting, potentially counting conservative votes. So I just want to make sure that, you know, there are election officials there that are being watched, being monitored, that anybody and everybody can go in and we can create perfect transparency, Nelson. And, hey, after all, you've heard it before. you got to have a license to fish. you got to have a license to hunt. you got to have a license to drive. Why don't we have uh, an ID to vote? All right. What are the liberals All scared right. of, right? Give, give me a, give, <laughs> give me a, what's the third one? Uh, we got loyalty and betrayal. Loyalty and betrayal. I don't know if I could ask yeah. a question about uh, that. Give me another one. Authority versus subversion. That's kind of like loyalty and betrayal, yeah. I think. What about sanctity versus degradation? 
All right. Well, we kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, we bit did that with gay marriage about, and trans issues. What about and, abortion? Yeah, definitely abortion as well, right? Well, we're going to take the... The sanctity of life. Man, the sanctity of life. You hear these terms uh, too, right? We degrading. Don't, yeah, yeah, degrading degrading life. I mean, we're going to abort... Uh, the what, sanctity seven, of eight, controlling your own body, right? I mean, both yeah. sides use it, but they yeah. just see it differently. And they also use different terms. I don't think liberals are smart enough for whatever reason to use these terms that are so clearly morally loaded. Like you don't hear liberals going, what about the sanctity of the woman? No, they say things like female choice, which doesn't sound quite as uh, divine as the sanctity of <laughs> divine. a life, right? Because But most of their voters are secular. And see, I think you kind of touched on something that's fundamentally untrue mm-hmm. about American politics. Mm-hmm. A lot of people look at American politics and say, well, there's this swath of voters in the middle. We got to get them. But really, I think (laughs) elections are about getting your people to show up, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And the only way to get the choir to sing is to preach to them. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's very little lost in going left and right. I know the punditry and the, the talking heads on cable news or you know, on podcasts like ours, we'll say, well, you got to get this middle, you got to get that mm-hmm. middle. I mean... That's larger than illusion, listen, you think. Listen, the undecided voter, well, I'll ask it to you this way. Do you know who you're going to vote for? Oh, absolutely. Do, I mean, I can lie and say I do don't, you but know, of course I know. Do you know anybody that doesn't that know? That doesn't, that no. honestly is confused no. about what no. choice they're going to... Absolutely that, not. Look, and so this idea that, that Kamala Harris is still introducing herself to America, that's the silliest thing that's, I've ever that's heard. That's absolutely Silly. It's so silly. And she's then, been the then, vice president for how long? Then, Four years. And I just love. And she ran for president before that. It's, it's almost been, like we're trying to take ourselves too seriously. Like there's all these questions. Well, what is she gonna do? She needs to define her policy. Mm-hmm. Because, okay, what is Trump gonna do to fix the economy? Tariffs. Yeah. But like, what is he going to do? What is what is his policy? Yeah, it's almost nobody like maybe maybe people like cares. Trump because he doesn't play that game. Like he plays his own game, right? Literally, I guess he doesn't play that but game. But I, I just he I, says stuff I that hate is just the so idea out there. That in they keep, she needs to do a better job of like defining her positions. Like what? She's a Democrat. Yeah. Like you well, know I've the heard people I respect. You know I respect that I that I think you know love the uh, love Kamala Harris that say things like. Well, you know, she hasn't been really specific on policy. And did you see the faces she was making when Trump was on stage? I'm like, she was laughing. Wow. I mean, by the way, could you have held a straight face no. whenever no. you heard him talk about eating no, dogs? No, I think cats? that's very helpful, actually, to yeah. sit there and laugh. Like, what do it, you want it, me to say? It that's makes you look normal, right? It's an authentic yeah, response. And then, in terms of like policy, we know that the American people don't have time or the <laughs> taste for policy. Al <laughs> Gore got in trouble talking too much, right? So did uh, Al John Gore Kerry. was a, a policy wonk. Yeah, they Jimmy talk Carter too much. was a policy wonk. And I wonk. think Elizabeth Warren would be a bad candidate because she's a wonk. Yeah, like, she's a wonk. It doesn't work, man. What works is Tim Waltz. Yes. <laughs> if he was yes. running for president, I think it'd work even better than with her right now. Maybe. Because he's so salt to the earth, right? Maybe. He's so salt to the You earth. know, we like to see ourselves in these candidates. We like to be able to connect with them on an yeah. emotional level, on a personal level. And yeah, it's I, like our porn, right? We don't want <laughs> no, to I watch don't, porn I definitely don't want and to... see somebody more handsome than us. We like seeing the troll in the porn because we um, feel better about ourselves. <laughs> we go, wow, I could get a woman like that. And this segment is brought to us by my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> well, shout, I'm just saying Ron Jeremy was one of the most popular. Ron Jeremy no, was one of the no, most popular no, no, porn stars ever because he looked like no, a gremlin. No, and we looked at him and thought, he doesn't intimidate me. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I, I don't I, want young, handsome studs in my porn. I'm sorry. And I don't want smart, pencil neck know-it-alls that are all wonky to be my presidential candidate. You don't. Huh? You, nobody looks or listens to Trump and goes, well, Man, that is that the basis guy, of that, that is guy's that smart. is the basis of a lot of his appeal, and he's he said many times, "I don't talk like them, I don't act like them, I'm not a politician." I mean, if you ever listened to him and thought, "Ah, clearly I can't do this job," uh, you know, I mean, he gives me hope. Do you, when do I you, listen to him, I'm thinking, "Wow, I could be president." Well, I'm going to tell you a little dirty secret. Yeah, the people who founded this country, mm-hmm. your John Adams, your Thomas Jeffersons, Washington to yeah. Franklin. They were the elites. They were the 1%. They mm-hmm. were smarter than the average bear. Yeah. And there was a time when we weren't intimidated by that, and we trusted that maybe they actually did we care. We preferred that, didn't we? Yeah, We course, saw that as a good course. thing. And it was the same thing in the 1890s and the you know, not early 1900s. Do we blame Rockefeller Robert? for that? No, like, who I mean, do we blame look, for that? Look, we, there was criticism of Rockefeller, to be sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, I point our listeners to Ida Tarbell's piece yeah. on... Uh, 
on Standard Oil and its power. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of people admired Carnegie and Vanderbilt and Rockefeller because they really did come from nothing. Yeah. And, and they used their talents and their brain power. Um, and, you know, maybe some of them got lucky. Uh, but we looked up to people who were better than us. And now I almost feel like we've come to a point where we look down mm-hmm. on anybody because we perceive them to be looking down on us. And it's just not the case. Some people are elite. You know, I mean, Abraham Lincoln was a genius. He was elite. Yeah. Uh, TR, uh, FDR, these guys were, were special. The exceptional presidents, the exceptional yeah. leaders are the exception. And that's okay. Well, well speaking of elite... Our audience, the couch surfers are elite. Oh, the couch surfers are awesome. Amy Alley. We got to talk about some elite. of these couch surfers. Ben yeah. Sorensen, he's elite. He's elite. My friend Trav Dorn That's is, a, the, is very that much friend elite. From That's my friend from Abbeville, oh, South Carolina. Shout if out. If you need your lawn shout mowed, out, if you need your shrubs <laughs> trimmed, if you need any kind of yard work, you better reach out to Trav Dorn because he's the man. Absolutely. No, Michael Martin here in Wilmington, North Carolina. I've got so many friends and supporters and listeners. They're elite, and you guys make... Us, who we are, and we appreciate you. Who are we? We are. Put them on the couch, Nelson. And with that, I think we're going to let the audience go and enjoy the rest of their weekend. We will let the audience go with what we know, yeah. which Nelson, is plenty. It's been hey, a pleasure, listen, man. Just a reminder again, we're getting close. we got like 53 days left until the election. Vote, vote, vote. And, that, and for that, you need to register. Yeah, so. absolutely. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next time. There's a place called Springfield, Ohio, that you've been reading about. 20,000 illegal Haitian immigrants have descended upon the town of 58,000 people. Residents are reporting that the migrants are walking off with the town's geese. They're taking the geese. You know where the geese are? In the park, in the lake. And even walking off with their pets. My dog's been taken.